Right, so this is an interesting specimen because it's actually not complete, it's just a part of a fish that fell out of the cliff and this is all I found of it. And if you can imagine, this is the sort of flank of the fish here. And then the skull, the back of the skull is here and that rest of the skull there is actually worn off and missing. But what's really interesting about this is this black mass here. Okay, because when you look closely, it's actually enclosed, the ribs of that fish are over it. So it's actually inside the throat of the fish. Now, it wasn't probably originally there because you imagine this thing rotting. And it's probably as, it, as the weight increases with the sediment, it's pushing it up into the sort of throat cavity. You can see here where the stomach would be. All the scales are missing, where the body gases have built up and exploded and the stomach sort of has just gone to the wind. But really what that black mass is, is actually the ink sac of a squid. So we know fish are actually feeding on all sorts of food items, including squid ink, which is probably quite calorific. And this one here is another fish here, which we're actually looking inside the middle of the fish. In other words, all these ribs and vertebra would be covered by the scales and that they've all erupted off and you've just got the inside view of the other side of the fish showing the scales still articulated. But what's really interesting again is in the stomach region, this black mass here. And you can see that's it another part of partial ink sac of a squid. Now the other thing we get are lots and lots of coprolite, in other words, fish poo. It's phosphatic, um, and more often than not, it preserves uh, in an anoxic environment, because naturally bacteria even break down fish poo. It normally gets absorbed and, and re-cycled sort of cycled by other organisms. But because it's anoxic, the sea floor here, in other words, there's not much oxygen, we get that preservation here. So this one here, which is a lovely specimen, has actually got a like a spiral twist to it. And we know without a shadow of a doubt that that's actually come from the intestines of a shark. So imagine a shark dying, all its cartilage and everything else being, you know, uh, eroded away or whatever, or sort of, and all we're left with is just this intestinal tract full of um, coprolytic material. And so that, we know that's definitely a, from a shark. Now this one here, if you saw it on a footpath, you wouldn't walk on it, but that's from another type of probably fish. We don't know the manufacturers of these, but they're really, really interesting because they are characteristic shapes of certain coprolites. This one here is a possible coprolite, it's phosphatic, but in it actually are all goose barnacle plates. And when we look at these barnacle plates, they're not sort of eroded by the stomach acid. So could this be not a coprolite, could this be what the fish has actually coughed up? We do, there's a lot of work yet to be done on it. Whereas this lower coprolite here, you can see these black scales and they're actually black scales of a fish called a spiderinchus. They're normally really well enameled and these are slightly dull. Now that indicate the stomach acid has actually eroded that sort of shiny surface off. But when we look at these scales, we can actually identify these scales as coming from a fish called a spiderinchus. And this is the typical fish that it represents. So something like a shark or something's eaten one of these dead fish and the scales have gone through the gut and they've passed through in this little coprolite. But you get all sorts. There's another one there that's got these funny little twists. Another one there that's excreted out. And there is a big chunk of bone there and there's another one there. So we get all sorts of bones, vertebrae in there, and goodness knows what. But what we've not found is any coprolites from the Kimmeridge clay with any reptile bones in. Now in the Lias from Lyme Regis, you get coprolites and some of them rarely have small, probably juvenile, really small juvenile pleasures, uh, ichthyosaur vertebra in them. We don't get them here yet. And the biggest coprolite I've found to date is about yay big. And it's probably again from a big shark. So we don't find any reptilian coprolites in the Kimmeridge clay to date. The thing is with the Kimmeridge clay is that shark remains, the cartilage, um, in other words, the structure of the skeleton are extremely rare. We get lots and lots of coprolytic material, loads of it, but we don't. Shark remains, i.e. the skeleton of them, extremely rare.
possibly, but again, um, certain currents can wash these things or can go down. Um, yeah, you're, you're right, but we don't find actually looking through the whole of the Kimmage claim, we've got 500 meters we're looking through, individual shark teeth or shark teeth we don't often find, they're quite rare. The only thing I've ever found with, with the shark, if I find a partial skeleton of a shark, often the teeth are there. Enameloid teeth, there are very, uh, lots of those. And if we look at the lower Kimmage clay, uh, there where we get concentrated sort of bone material, shark teeth are really, really common. Uh, but in the Kimmage clay here at Kimmage, individual shark teeth or even shark teeth without anything else um, around them is extremely rare. 